Hello, everyone, and welcome to USMLE Domination High Yield Tutorial number 21. I can't believe we're already on number 21. Let's take a look and start, as we always do, with a high yield question. I promise we'll come back to this high yield question at the very end. And there will actually be multiple questions during this tutorial, actually. So uh, please stay tuned. This is a 49-year-old female that presents with acute epigastric pain that is rated as 9 out of 10. She is afebrile, and her vital signs are stable. She takes ibuprofen regularly for abdominal pain, but otherwise takes no other medications. She has no past surgical history. Her radiograph is shown below. What's the next best step in management? Is it testing for helicobacter pylori, prescribe a proton pump inhibitor, upper endoscopy, or surgery? What's the next best step in management? I promise we'll come back to this question at the very end. I wanna to talk today about pneumoperitoneum. Pneumoperitoneum means that there's free air in the abdomen, okay? And there can be benign causes and there can be more concerning causes of pneumoperitoneum. I think for the USMLE, it's important to know the various causes and know how to recognize it on an X-ray or a CT because they can show that to you. And there can be some dire consequences for pneumoperitoneum. It's a do not miss diagnosis. So I want everyone to be comfortable with being able to see it and recognize it immediately. So these are some of the most important causes for pneumoperitoneum. One of which is a post-operative state normally, right? You do an exploratory laparotomy, you're gonna normally have free air in the abdomen. That's not necessarily concerning because you expect there to be free air because you violated the peritoneum. Now, obviously if there's large amounts or volume of free air, even after a laparotomy, that can be concerning. Barotrauma, when a patient has positive pressure ventilation, they can develop pneumothoraxes, pneumomediastinum, that air can then dissect into the, pneumo, into the peritoneum, into the abdomen, and you can get small amounts of pneumoperitoneum. A feeding tube placement, you put a feeding tube in and it perforates a, you know, the stomach or the duodenum, it can result in pneumoperitoneum. Now perforation from an ulcer, like a gastric or a duodenal ulcer, or even a bowel perforation, that's a common cause which is a concerning cause of pneumoperitoneum, right? You start to see free air in the abdomen. You know, you often want to see if the bowel has been perforated, okay? So very important thing to remember. Trauma, you can have intestinal perforation from trauma, from a motor vehicle collision, from penetrating injuries, right? So that's another important cause of pneumoperitoneum. Inflammatory entities like appendicitis, diverticulitis, when there's a lot of inflammation, ultimately, you know, the appendix after there's inflammation and obstruction, it can burst and result in air into the peritoneal space, right? The same is true for acute diverticulitis. So always consider that when you have pneumoperitoneum as well. Peritonitis, again, you have infection of the peritoneum can result in pneumoperitoneum. And even, you know, certain medications like steroids can result in pneumoperitoneum. So you can see that there's a very wide range of causes. Not all of them are concerning, but important to know that there are benign and concerning causes of pneumoperitoneum or free air under the diaphragm. And I want to show what this looks like on an abdominal x-ray. Now, of course, you know, a supine x-ray is going to be limited. If a patient is lying down, it's going to, they're going to have a limited capacity to evaluate free air. Usually an upright x-ray or a CT is better in identifying pneumoperitoneum or free air. And if we take a look here along the left side of the image, this is a normal abdominal x-ray, right? So you see, you know, this is the right lung here. It's black because it's aerated air is black. This is the left lung. This is the heart here. Along the midline, you have the spine. This is the thoracic spine where the ribs are coming off. This is the lumbar spine. This is L1 right here. And here in the abdomen, we can see the, uh, the dome of the diaphragm. And this is the liver shadow. And notice that there's no air or dark areas under the right hemidiaphragm. There's no dark areas under the left hemidiaphragm, right? This is where the spleen would be. We just have a normal non-obstructed bowel gas pattern. We have some gas here, but this is within the confines of bowel structures like colon, right? We can even see some stool here. There's some gas here that confines to the shape of the bowel, right? We have nothing to suggest that there's free air or air or air is gonna look very dark or black, you know, that isn't outlined by normal bowel. Contrast that to this upright view here, we can see that there are these dark linear areas here, right? That do not confine to the shape of the bowel. This is all free air. This is pneumoperitoneum, free air under the diaphragm, right? As we say, right? So very important to recognize this as a call as a finding of pneumoperitoneum or free air under the diaphragm. You want to consider the benign and concerning causes based on the clinical vignette that they give you on the USMLE. But if they show you this type of plain film or an x-ray, you should automatically be able to realize that there's gas here under the hemidiaphragm, whereas on the normal x-ray, we did not see that free air under the hemidiaphragm. On a CT, I'll explain how this looks like as well. So on a normal CT on the left side, 
you know, this structure here is the liver. You know, again, this is an axial image. So the top of this image is anterior. The bottom of this image is posterior. This here is the right side of the patient. This here is the left side of the patient. Here you have the liver. This organ right here is the spleen. You have the pancreas that's sitting here along the midline. This here is the aorta. And to the right of this is the IVC, okay? This here, this dark area is just the fat, right? This is the peritoneal fat. This is the subcutaneous fat. Fat appears kind of dark, right, on CT. So and this, of course, is the vertebral body here. This is, you know, the posterior elements here. These bright areas are the ribs, right? So normally we don't see any air, any dark area. Now we do see air here. This is in the stomach. So this is what air would look like, but this is air within the lumen of the stomach, and that's okay. We contrast that here on this image, this CT image. We have the liver here, but all this dark area that's outlining the liver, this is all free air in the peritoneal space outlining the liver, right? Outlining the hepatic dome. So this is definitely a case of, you know, a decent amount of free air in the abdomen, pneumoperitoneum, the cause of which we don't know. You know, we need a clinical vignette to determine that, but we can identify that this is free air on a CT examination. We don't see that dark area here. We only see it where it should be located, which is in the lumen of the spleen, okay? So I want to talk about peptic ulcer disease because that's an important cause of pneumoperitoneum uh, that is stressed on the USMLE. And typically we're talking about gastric and duodenal ulcers. They can perforate, you know, and they can cause free air in the abdomen. Uh, the most important causes of peptic ulcer disease is helicobacter, pylori infection, and then the use of NSAIDs, so things like ibuprofen or Advil. Those things have a high predisposition to causing peptic ulcer disease. This typically presents with epigastric pain or kind of midline abdominal pain. It's best diagnosed with endoscopy, right? So we typically do an endos upper endoscopy to evaluate for ulcer disease. And of course, peptic ulcer disease is treated you know, with a triple therapy, a proton pump inhibitor, amoxicillin, and a clarithromycin. Uh, we typically give those antibiotics to, you know, eradicate the helicobacter pylori, which is, you know, usually an important cause for peptic ulcer disease. I have a question for you. So a 67-year-old male complains of indigestion or dyspepsia. What's the next best step in management? Is this endoscopy, a barium swallow, prescribe a PPI, or do surgery? What's the next best step in management? Of course, the answer here is going to be endoscopy because the patient is 67 years old. So there are alarm symptoms that the USMLE is going to expect you to know. Anyone who presents with indigestion or dyspepsia, you're always going to do an endoscopy. The endoscopy is always going to be the right answer if they have one of these things in the vignette. So the age greater than 50, in our case, it was 67 years old. They have weight loss, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, pain with swallowing, anemia, family history or personal history of GI malignancy, a personal history of peptic ulcer disease, a history of gastric surgery or vomiting. Any of these symptoms, you see that? The answer is automatically going to be endoscopy on the USMLE. I can assure you that that's going to be the answer. Make sure you know these alarm symptoms for the USMLE. Let's go to another high yield question. So a 55 year old female with epigastric pain is found to have a gastric ulcer on a CT. What's the next best step in management? Is it a prescribe a PPI, do a biopsy, do surgery or observe? And of course the answer here is gonna to be to do a biopsy because this is a gastric ulcer, right? If it was a duodenal ulcer, that would be different, right? You know, you would, you know, you would consider, you know, maybe doing a PPI or, you know, maybe doing an endoscopy, but, you know, you would do a biopsy for gastric ulcer because there's a high chance of malignancy with gastric ulcer. So you always want to biopsy gastric ulcers on the USMLE. Hope that isn't clear. So I want to come back to the high yield question. So we had a 49 year old female presenting with acute epigastric pain. That's nine out of 10. She's afebrile. Her vital signs are stable. She takes ibuprofen regularly for abdominal pain, but otherwise takes no meds. She has no past surgical history. Her radiograph is shown below. What's the next best step in measures? Okay, this is a young person, so not greater than 50 years old, okay? But they do have epigastric pain. It's pretty severe. It's nine out of 10. She has a risk factor for peptic ulcer disease, ibuprofen or an NSAID, right? So we're already thinking epigastric pain, NSAID. This is likely a case of peptic ulcer disease, but there's free air under the diaphragm, right? So she has peptic ulcer disease and she has... Now, free air, which means that that ulcer has perforated. That's a surgical emergency, right? So we're going to want to take this patient to surgery. Surgery is obviously going to be the right answer here. This is testing your ability to identify free air under the diaphragm and recognize that this is a clinical vignette for peptic ulcer disease. So surgery is going to be the answer here. Hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tune in next week for another super high yield USMLE tutorial.